Okay, today is 23 May 2001. We're at the uh, Lexington Avenue Armory in Manhattan, and we're interviewing Mr. Larry Klein. And my name is uh, Wayne Clark. Uh, Mr. Klein, uh, tell us about uh, where you were born and raised. I was born in Manhattan, 1925. From Manhattan, after a few years, my family moved up to the Bronx. And I was amazed to see a park with so many trees and leaves, etc. And it was like farmland. And then walking further into the Bronx, uh, we saw the Bronx Zoo. And it was, it was amazing to see the animals roaming basically free, except that they're fenced thin, you know, with mm -hmm. a large area of uh, grassland for them. But it was very interesting. And I was only seven years old then. And from, from the Bronx, I, uh, my family stayed at this one place, which uh, address was uh, 2153 Southern Boulevard, which is right across the street from the entrance to the Bronx Zoo on Southern Boulevard. And uh, from there, my family, after a number of years, moved a few blocks away, a little uh, further away from the Bronx Zoo, down to uh, 182nd Street, 760 East, uh, East 182nd Street. And that's where we stayed until World War II started. Now, what kind of work did your father do? My father originally was doing quite well in the 20s. He was in, he was in the millinery line. And uh, gradually the line started to peter out to where there wasn't too much work, but he stuck to it and he, had, he always worked. He always made money for the family to live on. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I have three brothers and one sister. Uh, now they're all in the late uh, 60s, and my sister, who I love very dearly, was adopted because my family, uh, my mother had four boys and she always wanted a girl. And my aunt was married to a merchant marine man who was killed in action on the uh, Atlantic seas. And, uh, when she had the baby, uh, she, she didn't want the baby for some reason, which I'm not aware of. And my mother adopted the baby. So she's basically our sister, being born in the family, etc. And, and she's a beautiful girl, too. Uh, from that point on, uh, when December 7th, on the date of December 7th, I was in a theater called The Deluxe on Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. And, and I was uh, 16 and a half years old at that time. I remember walking out of the theater when the picture was over and, the, and I saw people gathering around the newsstands and I couldn't understand why. When I reached my home, my father told me to listen, turn on the radio and listen, which I did. And President Roosevelt was making a speech to Congress about the attack on Pearl Harbor. My brother, who was at the time, uh, I believe he was 17 and a half or 18, he was only a year and a half older than I was, uh, he immediately, immediately enlisted in the Marines, and uh, he's gone now, unfortunately, but he was one of the first Marines to land on Port El Canal, and he picked up malaria there, and uh, he gave him hell throughout his, throughout his life, but he was one of the Marines, and he did his job well, as well as the rest of the Marines on the island. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I couldn't enlist until I was 17 years old. I was only 16 and a half at that time. And then when I reached the age of 17, I told my parents that I wanted to enlist in the Navy. I had to give it some thought because at that time, 
Uh, strange as it seems, I, I could swim, but I didn't want to live in a foxhole. Mm -hmm. So the thoughts were, uh, were going towards the Navy, and then I finally made up my mind. I enlisted in the, the, to, in the Navy in Manhattan, and I was shipped out to uh, Portsmouth, not Portsmouth, uh, to Rhode Island. Uh, I forgot the name of the base. Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, we had basic training there for three and a half months. I was assigned to a man of war called the USS Quincy. Strange as it seems, at that time, there was a battle going on for Guadalcanal. And basically, we really lost the battle because we lost four cruisers and a few other ships besides. And one of the cruisers was named the Quincy, USS Quincy. And uh, one of the shipbuilding yards in Massachusetts, Quincy, Mass, Bethlehem Yards, they were building another cruiser, brand new one, wasn't quite finished, and they decided to rename it. The original name was given to St. Paul. They changed it to the Quincy. Uh, the first Quincy numbers were CA-39. The second Quincy was CA-71. Uh, and uh, it was commissioned in January of 1943. And from my uh, Newport, Newport, Rhode Island training base station, I was transferred to Boston, Mass, where they have a receiving station called, uh, oh, what's the name? Fargo Building, the Fargo Building. That is a main central area for most of the ships on the East Coast to train and receive crew members for all countries who are active in World War II. We had English, we had Turkish, we had all, all nations. And uh, then I was there for a few months and I have to say, I have to tell a little story about being there. All my life I was always interested in airplanes, recognition and so forth. When we had a recognition course in the Fargo building, Whenever the lieutenant instructor gave tests, I always got a hundred on it. All, all the answers were correct. So he asked me one day to stay over, and he wants to give me a special test. I said, fine. And when he gave me the special test, he gave me, he, uh, he took 100 slides of, of all types of enemy and allied aircraft and flashed them on a screen at one one hundredth of a second. And out of the one hundred I got ninety nine right. The one I, I missed was a head on view of an American medium bomber, which looks like a few other type bombers. But he was so impressed he asked me would I be interested in being his assistant? And I said, sure, yes, absolutely. He was stationed in Boston and Floyd Bennett Field, training pilots for recognition. So he said he put a request into my commanding officer for, for a transfer. Well, my commanding officer said, if he's that good, we need him on the ship. And that was it. I didn't mind, mm -hmm. because I had an interesting life on a ship. A living, I never lived on a ship before, never traveled like I did on the ship, and it was just great. And besides that, it made a man of me, visiting all the various countries, etc. Our first uh, assignment when the ship was ready to sea was to convoy four ships to Europe, which we did without any incident. Uh, and then I understood that we were assigned to a bombardment group for D-Day, 
for we were assigned to a, a, an area called Utah Beach in France, but this was a few months away yet. But we were told that uh, the ship was assigned for D-Day. We had liberty in various countries, in Scotland, Ireland, and England, and uh, we, we traveled quite, quite a bit from each country with the ship. It was very interesting meeting the people, talking to the people. They all, they all were very, very nice to the sailors, the soldiers, etc. <clears throat> then from that point on, when D-Day was drawing close, we pulled out to sea for some training practice. Uh, we went to an area in the channel on the southern tip of England just to, I guess, just to try some things out. And then we came back to England and uh, I believe the next few, few days we were ready for D-Day. Originally D-Day was scheduled for June 4th, mm -hmm. but because of the bad weather, they changed it to June 6th. And there's a story in that uh, day, June 4th, was that all the ships were headed out towards France for D-Day. And we got word to abort the trip and go back to England, which we did, except for the French battleship Richelieu. Evidently, they, this is the story, I don't know how true it is, she did not get the message. And when D-Day came June 4th, she was the only ship on a firing line off France. And uh, supposedly uh, they had a battle there until it was out of range of the German guns. How, how true the story is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's go on with the story. It, uh, then we sailed out June 5th, about 12 o'clock at night, in a very there was dark skies. The whole crew was at that, their battle stations. And we were passing a number of flotillas of uh, military ships with their equipment on it, etc., troop ships. And we finally arrived at our firing station and it was called Utah Beach. This was my first battle. And I tell you, I, I was frightened, I was scared. It's only normal when, mm -hmm. when things like this happen. But what got me is that all the uh, shells being fired, not only at our aircraft, but on the ground, it was just like a 4th of July. It was beautiful, really, but mm -hmm. unfortunately they were exploding and it looked, uh, it looked good, but it was bad for the soldiers, enemy as well as ours. Did your uh, ship take any hits? Now, the, uh, we were told, uh, the Quincy was instructed not to open fire until 5.30 a.m., which all the ships had the same, same instructions. Well, evidently, as the sun was rising, or well, not the sun, but the light was coming up, the enemy saw our ship. And they opened fire from three railroad guns underneath 15, 20 feet thick concrete bunkers. And our pilot from, the, from our ship was flying a Spitfire as a spotter for our guns, our, our large guns telling up 15, down 15, whatever. So since the Germans were firing at us, which they were, uh, the captain decided to open fire and start shooting back. Well, we opened fire at 5.20 a.m., which for many magazines and books that I've read indicates that our ship was the first ship to be fired upon and the first ship to return fire on D-Day. And uh, it's, it's an honor in a way, but we couldn't just sit there and wait for, wait for them to hit us. So uh, we opened fire. We knocked out three railroad guns within an hour. That saved a lot of troops. They were coming in on barges. We happened to see two barges coming in together like this and one of them hit a mine and they capsized with the crew and equipment and everything. They were only about a quarter of a mile away from us. 
we saw American soldiers' bodies floating by us, etc. It was very, very sad. But we kept at our stations, kept firing, and uh, one of the destroyers called the Glennon was trying to help the soldiers on a the beach. They were pinned down by a pillbox. And she got so low, uh, she got so close to shore that she was scraping the sandbars on a keel. But she did help them quite a bit. And she took a terrific hit from a large shell and split the, the destroyer in half. It sunk right in the spot. The, the superstructure was stayed up above the water. Out of 238 men, there was only about a handful, about 10 or 12 men that survived that incident. And they were on a whaleboat passing our ship and our uh, officer of the day on deck signaled them to come aboard our ship and they said, no way, no way. They're going out to the troop ship. Once was enough. So that's what they did. Uh, we continued firing and uh, then that's the first day. We, uh, when you have general quarters and everything is quiet, but you're still at general quarters, they relieve you. Half the crew gets relieved, the other half stays at the battle station. So I went down to take a shower, and sure enough, while in the shower, general quarters sounded. I took a towel and I ran up to my battle station. What else could I wear? <laughs> so uh, when, I, when I came on deck, my eyes almost popped out. It was daylight. And that daylight was from star shells. The enemy had fired what they call star shells. You know what they are? They like are the parachutes mm -hmm. with flares on it. And the whole area was lit up. And a few minutes later, we heard a, like a rocket motor passing overhead and dropped in between the battleship Texas, which was off our port side, and our ship about 200 yards. It was a missile. It was a rocket missile they fired at us. And from that time on, it was just a matter of hit and miss. We saw no aircraft in the air at all during the whole invasion. The, uh, our flyboys had the whole area covered very, very well. And speaking for the flyboys, I tell you, I got to give them a lot of credit for what they did in their war. Second of all, I saw a squadron of what they call A-20 medium bombers going overhead, and one bomber got struck right in the bomb bay and blew up, uh, right amongst his squadron. Luckily, no other plane went down. But uh, without those planes, I don't know what would happen to any of us. And we had the whole area covered. And then uh, another squadron of P-47 Thunderbolts came over and they had 500 pound bombs under each belly. There's about 10 or 12 of them. And they dive bombed the enemy in a forest where they were hiding with, the, with their tanks. And uh, there was a story about them that they, that they dived so fast that the paint was burnt off the, off the airplanes. So, uh, and as I say, uh, when, a, when, a, when dropping bombs, yes, an explosion is tremendous. But when a plane dies and drops a bomb, it's going at a higher speed. And even on water, you can feel the ground shake. So uh, it was quite, quite a, a thing to see. Then uh, we were there, I, I believe, uh, about 10 or 12 days. And everything was quiet. Our boys were able to land. And then we went, we needed supplies, ammunition, etc. And uh, we were told to report to the city of Portsmouth, which is the southern tip of England. We had a destroyer escort, a, a destroyer to escort us to Weymouth, town of Weymouth. Portsmouth and Weymouth are next door to each other. But they said first go to Portsmouth, then to Weymouth. Then, when we reached port, our ship, our captain, was so anxious to get back to action that he, uh, he had the ship travel 
something like 38 knots for a 19,000 ton cruiser that's 46 miles an hour, like a PT boat, in other words. And our destroyer escort was coming over the, the horizon when we reached port. They were coming behind us, so they couldn't catch up to us. <clears throat> From that point on, we loaded up, we were there for three days, and then a, re a report came in that the, I don't believe it was the Canadians or the English, I don't know which, one or the other was having trouble with the cliff up there. They had to climb up the cliff, so they, uh, they asked for assistance. When we got there, we couldn't, find any resistance at all. They were up on top already. So, but in the meantime, uh, the Allied saw our uh, American soldiers asked for help at Utah Beach because the Germans were using a German, a um, French church as a lookout tower for spotting their shells to hit the beach. So they asked us to knock out the church. We knocked out the whole town. We completely flattened the whole town. Then another call came in from our Allied headquarters that uh, uh, there's a uh, a car loaded with generals and officers heading in a certain direction, and uh, can we do anything about it? We fired a couple of fighting shells. We knocked them out. From that point on, it was just a matter of mopping up. Then, uh, when we finished uh, with, the, with the invasion force, they were all settled. We, had, uh, we were asked for assistance in the Sherberg area. Now, Sherberg is a, uh, is a type of, uh, how should I say, it's a, it's a shipping area. And it had the harbor that Eisenhower wanted for our landing of supplies. So uh, we were instructed to form a small task force to uh, bombard uh, the city of Cherbourg because the Germans were caught in a pocket there. They couldn't get out through the mainland and they couldn't get out through sea. So, and they wouldn't surrender. So the Allied forces asked for uh, help in knocking them out. That's what we did. And it's considered the hottest naval engagement in naval history. A shell a second was fired at all the ships, including mine. We got shrapnel hits, and uh, some of our antenna wires were cut by, by the shells. But a British cruiser that was in front of us got hit with three shells. Something like 13 killed, 21 wounded. We were lucky. We didn't get hit. And from there, we sped away, returned to Portsmouth or Weymouth, one or the other, to resupply and head back to uh, America. From America, I mean, uh, while in America, we went to uh, uh, Boston Harbor. That was our home base, Boston Navy. The rumor was starting to spread that Roosevelt was going to come aboard our ship. And we don't know how true it was, but it was a rumor. The next thing, we, we were ordered down to uh, the area of Norfolk, Virginia, where they started to install an elevator. When we saw that, we, we figured the rumor was true. And from that point, we uh, just waited and see what happened. And then they, when they finished the elevator, they took it off. They took it off the ship in one piece. And then somebody said that it was canceled, that he's not coming aboard. But that wasn't true. That was to throw the rumor off, basically. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had two weeks leave coming for the whole ship. And we went into New York Harbor, into New York City. It was one of the greatest liberties I ever had. Mm -hmm. We were treated royally in, in uh, New York City with the show people, etc. And uh, I was home every night, almost every night. And uh, I had my family come down and look at the ship. And we did a lot of things at that time. From that point on, 
were just normal visits and the routine in Manhattan. And then the ship pulled out quietly one night, headed for Newport News, Virginia, picking up Roosevelt. We picked up Franklin Delano Roosevelt at Newport, Newport News at approximately 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. And the, all the crew, except those needed to operate the ship, were asked to stay below decks. Now, the story that I was told, why he was traveling by ship to Yalta was because he, uh, he wasn't feeling well and his, and his doctors told him, if you take a sea trip, you'll feel better. Don't fly. And he followed, followed the doctor's orders and with that, the, uh, he came, up, came aboard ship very quietly and we snuck out very quietly and he, uh, we had, he, the captain had taken the, the, the South Atlantic route, which is a very balmy, calm sea route. And Roosevelt had his daughter aboard with him to take care of him, Anna Bakichan. And uh, that's the first time I ever heard of a woman being aboard a man of war and traveling out at sea. With that, he, uh, he started to mingle with the sailors on, on board. And uh, he had a lot of admirals and generals aboard with him, his, his cabinet members. Not all of them, but most of them. <coughs> and then uh, he was talking to the deck, deck hands or the sailors doing their job on, on the board ship. <clears throat> and he was coming around closer to me, and I figured he'd come over and ask me what he's been asking everybody else, such as, where are you from, son? And actually they'd tell him and so forth, but me being me, I like to make people laugh. So when he, when he reached me, he said to me, where are you from, son? I paused for a couple of seconds, and I said, the Bronx. So. He, he laughed and then he shook and said, you mean New York City? I said, yes, sir. I just wanted to make you laugh, I said. He said, you sure did. <laughs> so anyway, from that point on, it was just a normal cruise until we hit the Straits of Gibraltar. I don't know, I didn't hear of any uh, submarines waiting for us there. So uh, everything was smooth. We went to the island of Malta. We, we uh, tied up to one of the mooring markers there, and a lot of visitors were waiting to come aboard, such as Churchill, uh, the Governor General of Malta, and that's about it, as far as I can remember. But he had a lot of dignitaries later on. And uh, they had their meetings, and in the meantime, the ship's crew had liberty. The island was closed off to everything. No calls coming in, no calls going out. It was lock, stock, and barrel locked up. And uh, it's, it was a, a beautiful island. You know, it's so old, and there's so many interesting things there to see. Uh, they had a cathedral there with a solid gold roof, covered with sheet metal roof, gold, all gold. Uh, they had mummified bodies of famous generals and uh, priests and whatnot that they that's what they do. So with that, they uh, they had uh, how should I say uh, they had their thing going, and I was on liberty most of the time. So uh, and the people were very nice to us. Uh, you know, they saw American soldiers, and you know, I remember Malta before I went into service through the movie tone news in the theaters how they were being bombed continuously by the enemy. And they said it was a, an island made of solid rock. And it is made of solid rock. It withstood the pounding tremendously. And the people were brave enough to, to withstand it and so forth. Then uh, while Roosevelt, uh, after two or three days in Malta, Roosevelt uh, flew out of Malta to the Yalta Conference. And then we 
We left Malta heading towards the Suez Canal, traveling through the full length of it. Now you read and see these things in magazine, books, and so forth, but to be on it, and to be in it, is tremendous. The feeling, the sights are tremendous, and so forth. And there was, there was a mistake going on for some reason. We, we tied up in the city of Alexandria for a few hours because they wanted to make sure no traffic was coming through the canal that might interfere with our ship because one day you go one way and another day you go another way. So we waited and everything was fine. We started through about midway. Here, here comes an ocean liner. No troops on it, just an empty ocean line. So luckily we had a wide spot in the Suez Canal and we came, we, we came about a foot apart or something. It was, it was very dangerous, you know, very bad. But anyway, it worked out. We, they cleared it without any problems and we continued on to uh, Great Bitter Lake. Great Bitter Lake is, is located at the end of the Suez Canal where if you dip a stick in it for a couple of seconds, it comes out all salt. So, so. Uh, and then we anchored there waiting for, the, for President Roosevelt to come back. In the meantime, he received dignitaries from various countries, such as Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, King Farouk of Egypt, some members from, from the French dele, delegation. I don't remember their, their name, but I have it in a book. And, uh, and I noticed near the horizon there were white, white uh, ships, uh, men, of, men of war. So when I asked an officer about it, he says, that's the Italian fleet. When they surrendered, they put them in that area out of the way. And uh, I have to laugh in a way, but uh, you know, the uh, Italian Admiral came over to pay his respects to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt turned them down, turned them away. You were the enemy, that was it. It's unfortunate, but that's what happened. Uh, then from that time on, Roosevelt came back, and uh, we, and, and then uh, we proceeded back to the Suez Canal into the city of Al Alex Alexandria where Churchill on his ship, his cruiser, was anchored in the harbor, visited Roosevelt again for another conference. And then when a few hours later the conference was over, we proceeded I thought to go back home, but instead we went to Algiers. We docked alongside one of these open docks, which is a big lock, built up, you know, with dirt in the middle, but pilings all around. And the population of Algiers was all loaded up on the docks to, to see what they can of our ship and Roosevelt, etc., and the people coming aboard. Uh, and I have to make this mention. The French Algerian women are beautiful. They don't wear too much makeup, but their features stand out tremendously beautiful. And uh, we never got a chance to go out with them or anything, but I, I, you know, just from looking how they looked, and it was just, uh, out of this world. But anyway, let's continue on. We, after three or four hours of waiting, I inquired, why, what are we waiting for? It was for the French uh, leader, uh, what's his name? Uh, the tip of my tongue. De Gaulle? De Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle. They were waiting for Charles de Gaulle. And evidently he snubbed Roosevelt because he was not invited to the Yorker Conference to have equal say. This is a story I got. How true it is, I don't know. Uh, so we waited about four hours. He didn't show up. 
Then we started home. We went through the Mediterranean, and we were a few miles, about 15 miles away from the Straits of Gibraltar. We, the ship's radio received a message from the Royal Air Force at Gibraltar. There's a, a submarine wolf pack waiting for us, about 12 to 15 submarines. In the meantime, the Royal Air Force had their planes fly over the Straits of Gibraltar, dropping depth charges. Our destroyer escorts did the same thing, and our ship went through traveling at top speed, 38 knots, and we continued that for about 12 to 14 hours. So we outdistanced the submarines, we kept the submarines down, they couldn't surface to uh, torpedo us, and uh, that was it, we came back, we came back to the States, to Newport News, and uh, we dropped off the president. But before I end that, that part of the story, there was a conference aboard in the captain's cabin with his cabinet, his military leaders, and our captain. And the President Roosevelt made a statement the USS Quincy will receive a presidential unit citation for this trip. The captain's yeoman, Al Avec, is the only person, only sailor that was sitting in on that meeting. He was the captain's yeoman, which is a secretary, and he heard President Roosevelt say it. To this day, we never received the presidential unit citation because we thought we had it when Roosevelt went back to Washington. But unfortunately, the man died two weeks after landing in Washington, and uh, we never followed through on it to see what's happening with that presidential unit citation. But uh, I, I'm still fighting, even 50 years later, I'm, I'm still fighting Congress for it. And they don't want to listen. Anyway, from that point on, uh, I was asked, well, oh, I forgot about the Pacific War. Uh, we were ordered to go to the Pacific, to Pearl Harbor. We went through Panama Canal a few days later. We arrived at Pearl Harbor, and my division was uh, transferred to Fort Island in Hawaii. And the ship went out to see to have uh, some training about kamikaze attacks, etc. But I was assigned to Fort Island with the division, aviation division. And uh, when everything, after the weeks passed, I did the, the uh, the ship got orders to, uh, to travel to the third fleet, to take up a position with the third fleet. So the aviation unit was transferred back to the ship, and we left Hawaii, which is beautiful, uh, into the uh, Pacific Ocean, which was beautiful. And when we arrived with, to the third fleet, in the Pacific, it was evening, it was late at night, about 11, 12 o'clock. Uh, our ship, ship's radar picked up a, a kamikaze plane. Larry, let me stop right here because we, we're out of... Uh... This is uh, tape two with Mr. Larry Klein. Go ahead, Larry. The, uh, it was a torpedo bomber harassing the task force at night, and our radar picked it up. It was near, we were the closest one to it, and we started open fire on it. Uh, after a few uh, shells, we did hit it. We did see the plane burn and crash into the ocean. 
Shortly thereafter, Admiral Hawes, Halsey, who was in charge of the fleet, stated to the captain and the crew of the Quincy, a job well done. And uh, then we continued on to our position in the task force. Uh, you wanted to go back to uh, the, the Kingfisher? Well, uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, going back to the to the uh, Atlantic. While I was in the Navy for a short time, well, I was assigned to the ship. I was assigned to Fire Control Radar Division. And I always wandered over to the catapult to see the planes. Since I was always interested in airplanes, I decided to put in a request for a transfer to the Aviation Division. And it was accepted. And I was so thrilled and happy about it. And I met the pilots and other crew members, and uh, we all got along well. Uh, from that point on, it was just a normal routine of maintaining the planes and uh, maintaining our quarters where we slept and so forth. Uh, any time the ship was in port, any port, uh, foreign country, as well as the United States, Usually the aviation division is transferred to an airport, to a field where a Navy has a base. And then when it's ready to pull out the sea, they uh, transfer the whole unit back to the ship. When D-Day came, I was not assigned to the aviation division at that time. And I missed being transferred in England, but I was told stories by some of the crew members how uh, England was being bombarded with these guided missiles that uh, were constantly keeping them awake at night and uh, dangerous. You know, when you hear the buzz bombs go over, it's all right when you hear the motor, but when, you, when, you, when the motor stops, you got your fingers crossed that it's going to keep on going for a little while longer because you don't know where it's going to hit, who it's going to hit. This is what they were telling me. So I guess I was lucky enough to be on the ship at the time in D-Day. Our commanding officer of that division uh, was a, uh, an airline pilot, I understood. Very, very good man, very nice man. Lieutenant Denton at the time, uh, that was his name. L Lieutenant Denton, trained to fly a Spitfire. So he can act as a spotter for our ship during the shelling of uh, Utah Beach. Uh, I guess that's about it now. And, uh, all right, now I'll go back to the Pacific. Okay. In the Pacific, after that kamikaze plane was shot down, we got a report that a group of kamikaze planes are approaching the task force. How they know that, I don't know. But they have, uh, they have their way of finding out things like that. And sure enough, at 9 o'clock, a group of kamikazes started attacking our task force. Our ship was assigned on, a side, on the starboard side of a carrier as an anti-aircraft anti ship. In other words, to shoot down any place trying to come in. We, we had approximately uh, uh, 12, what they call 40 millimeter quads, four guns in each quad. So we had quite a quite a firepower. Plus we had uh, six five inch twin gun mounts of a five inch, uh, how should I say, anti-aircraft guns as well. And they, well, you were used well on these attacks. Now, I was, my battle station was up on the top of the rear structure of the ship. So I had a beautiful view of everything. And this one kamikaze was coming in from the rear low. He was trying to hit this carrier. I don't recall the name of the carrier, but he was flying very low about 50 feet above the water. 
and he, he was uh, approaching uh, a battleship which was be directly behind the carrier. And one of our fighter planes, a Corsair, was on his tail shooting tracer shells. Some of the shells hit, but it didn't stop the kamikaze. As soon as the battleship started to open fire, the American plane, the pilot, banked away from that, from the kamikaze. And uh, he, and uh, the fact that the kamikaze was hit, he started to fly low and it hit the rear of the battleship, someplace, and uh, hit the battleship, so the rear uh, the stern of it. But the next second, there was no more plane. He ran into a five-inch shell that struck him directly in the nose, and it just crushed the whole plane into a ball of fire, and it went down. And that was the last we saw of the kamikazes for that day. Now, I remember, uh, I, don't, I don't recall the date that this happened, but it was very close to the surrender date. The, uh, we were sending out 1,000 plane raids. The Navy was sending out Navy planes, 1,000 planes at a time, over Tokyo. And when the 1,000 planes left the Third Fleet, President Roosevelt got word that the Japanese are willing to surrender. Third Fleet got to notice no more hostilities. They recalled a thousand planes which are loaded with bombs, rockets, and whatnot. And they can't land as long as they are carrying this army. So the Admiral and Halsey decided to have target practice, and our ship was called out to, to put a towing spar on the stern of it, about 50 yards away from the ship, to tow it with a flag indicating the target. And the planes came in shooting, shooting their rockets, their machine gun bullets, and dropping their bombs and whatnot. It was uh, quite a sight. And then finally, as each, each plane landed, uh, everything was peaceful again. They decided to have target practice. Every ship that was in the Pacific lined up one behind the other. Every major ship, that is, from a destroyer to a carrier, battleships, uh, cruisers, and one, lined up in, a, in single file. And our ship, incidentally, had carried drones for target practice a couple of months earlier. So we were asked to have these drones ready for target practice, which we did. Now, when you say drone, was that, was that a, a boat? Radio-controlled airplane. airplane. Model. Okay. The wingspan was something like uh, 15 feet, 15, 20 feet. Mm -hmm. They had 10 horsepower motors, and these were used for target practice. And it was, you know, if I had a movie camera, it, that, that, those pictures would be worth a great deal of money today because to see every ship in line going over the horizon was quite a sight. Well, anyway, as, as each drone was used for each ship, they, uh, they retired from their position. In other words, they would shoot it down. That was it. Then the next ship would come up behind us, astern of us, and they would shoot the, uh, the drone again, and so forth. It, it, it kept on going while it was daylight, but in the evening it stopped. Sometimes a carrier, for instance, went behind us, it was astern of us, and it was quite a sight looking up and seeing a carrier 90, 90, 90 feet in the air, you know, and we're down below. The thing was, they were instructed when the plane reaches a 45, or the drone reaches a 45 degree angle through the carrier, you cease fire. Well, unfortunately, some of them were trigger happy. They didn't do that. And they opened fire with, some, with, the, with the drone overhead, and when it crashed, luckily, it crashed on an open deck, but they had all the planes parked out there. 
And some of them, I would say, loaded with bombs, but they had gasoline in them. So uh, luckily, none of the drones hit the planes. And the other thing that happened was that uh, when they fired at the drone, the carrier, one carrier fired the drones, they got a direct hit with bullets, so it damaged the radar, radar con control of the plane. And it crashed into the, what they call SK radar, which is a search radar on the carrier, the highest part of the radar, of the carrier. Uh, it damaged that. Uh, and after that, there was nothing more. The next thing, uh, we were assigned to uh, go into Japan. This happened on August 15, 1945. Our ship was the first ship to enter Japan. I don't know whether our captain volunteered to go first or not because we had to go through minefields and a Japanese destroyer was ahead of us, was leading us through the minefield. Mm -hmm. Could have been a suicide mission too. So anyway, we went through and we ended up in Sagami Wan Bay. That's the bay that's at the foot of that majestic mountain with the snow cap on mm -hmm. it. Beautiful, beautiful sight. Did you get to go ashore? Yeah, that's, that's coming up. But first, there are a lot of people who have commented about the atomic bomb being exploded over to the, the two cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, prior to the surrender, when the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, the, the task force was 100 miles away from Hiroshima. The Air Force instructed the Navy to move their ships out a minimum of 100 miles, which they did. The next day, I, I don't recall the time, but it was daylight hours, while I was on deck, I saw, which I thought was lightning on the horizon by Japan, covering Japan. But it was strange because it was a lasting light. Uh, and it was quite large area, it covered quite, quite a large area. So I said, boy, they're having a rainstorm there, it's really gonna drown them out. 10 minutes later, 10, 15 minutes later, the chaplain gets on a PA system and said, for those people who heard or who saw the flash on the horizon and heard the, the thunder following shortly after, that was a new weapon dropped by the United States Air Force, uh, U.S. Air Force that uh, was called the atomic bomb. And it wiped out the whole city of Hiroshima. From the reports, he said that uh, the city is completely leveled. May God have mercy on their souls. Now, I have... This is the chaplain talking uh, when he said that. Now, I have an article from the New York Daily News that was just printed a couple of months ago about the atomic bomb. They, and then the question was, was that re revenge or was that something that just had to happen? It was not revenge. Don't forget, Japan started the war. We, we finished it. The people had nothing to say about the war in Japan. It was a militaristic regime that dictated everything to the common people. I felt sorry for the men, women, and children who were in innocent pawns of this, but we were at war. Then, then uh, when our ship went into the, through the gate, through the entrance of Sagami, Sagami Wan Bay. I was amazed what I saw. One of the things that Japan had to do uh, with the surrender was to mark every shore battery with a white flag. There were literally thousands of white flags 
along the shore and inland. As we went through the opening in the, for the, the going to Sakamiwan Bay, I counted to the, as best I can at least over, over a thousand flags as fast as I could. And if we had to invade Japan, invade Japan, the comments made by our military leaders were there would be a minimum of 100,000 casualties per day. And that's a hell of a lot of our boys would be little cut in. So I felt very strong about the atomic bomb being dropped. We had to. As a matter of fact, uh, about a year ago, I was, uh, I was asked if I wanted to be uh, invited on a Japanese television program to discuss the atomic bomb, uh, basically because you say you, that we should have dropped the bomb. I said, I never said that. I said, I felt sorry for the people that were the common people that had nothing to say about the war. And that's all. I, we, I, I am for the bomb. We had to drop it, and that's it. I'd rather see the enemy suffer than how American boys suffer. So they canceled out the program for me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I had to say that because I have friends now who are Japanese young men, and they, and they are great people. They are a great people. Uh, I have worked for some of their companies here in, in, in New York, and uh, I am a retired engineer, mechanical engineer, and I've done a lot of work for these large companies, and as I say, J J Japanese people are very courteous and very nice. There are bad ones, yes, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're very good. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, when we came home, oh, our ship was first assigned to disband and disarm the islands off of Japan and Tokyo. With that, they, uh, the islands that we took care of had many aircraft on it and arms. We sent landing parties to destroy all this equipment because we, we couldn't take it aboard. And uh, what they did take aboard was some rifles, guns, and Lugers, that is handguns, and swords. The sword they said already, I, uh, but I, I don't think of anything else. In one particular case with the sword, a uh, sword accidentally got in mixed in with the, with the group of swords that were put aboard our ship. Uh, was a 1,500-year-old sword that uh, the Japanese government requested that, that it be returned to the family. So uh, they sent a specialist over to our ship to search all the swords, and they found it. But I don't think the captain returned it to the family. I am not sure. Maybe he did. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, it was rather strange because, number one, the Japanese your, your first time, you, you, you are really seeing the enemy, you know, coming aboard with the uniforms and whatnot. And, uh, uh, but anyway, with all the swords, they were given out to the crew members and certain guns, Lugers and uh, handguns and, uh, and rifles were handed out to the crew. Uh, that's the only souvenirs we ever got from the world. Uh, and uh, what else can I say? My life has been very good. Now, when were you discharged shortly? I was discharged uh, on, I forgot the camp, but it was 1946. I was stationed, our ship was going to be decommissioned. We arrived in San Francisco Harbor, docked right next to the, uh, not the Golden Gate Bridge, but the San Francisco Open Bay Bridge. And uh, I was assigned to an aviation division at Alameda Air Station, which I stayed for approximately three months so we could be mustered out. And uh, they said that to be transferred to a base in, in New York to be mustered out, discharged from the service. And uh, 
it, uh, as I say, my life is very interesting on all these things that happen, even though some are minor and little. But uh, I never would have had a chance to do all these things if I didn't join the Navy. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, in the end, the Navy is a good life. They train you properly, you eat good food, and they take care of you. So, and they educate you. Mm -hmm. now the, the, Navy, the, the Navy itself, when I went into the Navy, I was a, a meek guy. I wouldn't even talk to women. Three months later, I'm a completely different man. <laughs> so it made me think differently about people, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, it, it really helped my life a lot. So I, I was very happy that I joined the Navy, that I enlisted in the Navy. And now, what I, what I don't understand, and, I, and even with this film, why did they wait 54 years to do this? You know, my mind is fresh about what happened, and I can tell you more and more interesting things, but unfortunately, I can only remember what I can remember. The book shows more, and they have books on World War II and so forth, but there's nothing like actually living it, being there. And the uh, same thing when I was inter interviewed by the BBC for the same thing just a couple of months ago, 2000, the year 2001. I can't understand, but I'm glad something is being done now for World War II veterans and the, the memories we had is being put down for the future. And I say one thing, war is hell. It is hell. So use that as a guide. If it's hell, don't do it. I mean, but you have to fight, you have to fight. Mm -hmm. I just uh, feel very strong about it. Larry, let me ask you, uh, once you got out of the service, did you uh, go back to school at all? I decided, when I got out of service, I decided to take a rest for a year. At that time, the uh, New York State Employment Office was giving the GIs $20 a week. In 1946, that was average money, you know. But it was enough to live on, because uh, I, I was still living at home. I hadn't decided what I wanted to do, but I did make one mistake in my life, and I'm sorry for it. While I was, after this is uh, when the ship returned to San Francisco, the, uh, I was assigned still to the aviation unit, and my commanding officer, Charles Little, made a statement to all of us. If you stay on three or four months more, I will recommend you for Annapolis. I wanted out because I was young. I, I was, when I was out of service, I think I was just 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had nothing to show except the experience I had. But uh, I decided to take a rest, and I said I wanted out, and that was it. But I'm sorry I did it, because as I got older, I realize how important education is. Very, very important. So with that, I lost out. But I did lose out completely because I used the GI Bill to go to school. And what I, what I learned, uh, what I did is I uh, signed up for a, to be a machine designer uh, under the GI Bill, which I, I did complete and get a job and work at many companies as a consultant. And then one day I said to myself, when I went to work for General Electric at the Flight Test Center up in Schenectady, New York, they had, well, Schenectady and uh, Troy, New York is a college area. Mm -hmm. And they had one of the top rated engineering colleges in Troy, Rensselaer Polytech. And I decided to go to back to school at night, to college. I went for two years nights. And then I uh, had a girlfriend back in New York and uh, she asked, why don't you transfer your credits down to City College and that way you can con continue. Well, unfortunately, City College did not accept Rensselaer's 
credit and all that. They accepted the credits, but the fact that they don't really require a language whatsoever is to, uh, to matriculate. And uh, I didn't want a language because I felt it was useless with a language if you take an engineering. Mm -hmm. So when I tried to transfer, they turned me down and I said, the heck. So I had approximately two and a half, to three years of college. I decided to go out in the field and see what happened. And it was fabulous, fabulous. My, uh, my first job I had was uh, uh, working, uh, helping design the bowling machine for Brunswick Ball Calendar Company. So that was the first, uh, second bowling machine. But the first company was uh, American Foundry Company. And uh, I was involved with the design of the second bowling machine. And uh, it worked out well from that point on. By the, by the time I finished working with my wife, I, my salary was up around $58,000 a year, which is sometimes at the time, which is 10, 15 years ago, is more than some college kids get. Mm -hmm. So I felt that in, my in the education I had, the things I learned from history, from my jobs and so forth, built up my life where I had a good life. I raised three children. I had three children, Robert. Well, my oldest one is a daughter. Is my daughter, Nancy Ann, who's a special ed teacher. And my second one is my son, who's a New York City police officer, but he's a college grad. And uh, my third one is another daughter who is beautiful. She looks like number 10 uh, in the movies. Uh, she, uh, she's a fashion designer and a model. So I'm proud of all my children. And your wife's name? My, my wife, well, we are divorced now. Uh -huh. After 37 years. I don't like the, you know, it's, it's sensitive to wipe mm -hmm. the heart, but me, I don't care. Money, money in it. Uh -huh. She, for one thing, she said to me one day, Larry, you make enough money to take care of the family. What do you say I use my salary? She was a school secretary to buy stock. She, she was interested in stock. I said, okay. Figure when we, we retire, we either have a lot of money or nothing. So the money went up. I left there. So anyway, when uh, when I found out she didn't even put my name on the stocks, uh, things start happening. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to go to any further okay. in my personal life because that's a sensitive thing. Okay. Any uh, grandchildren? I have two grandchildren, and I'm so proud of them because my daughter told me a few months ago, or back in February, it was, they had a national mathematics test. And my oldest one, who at the time was 14, came in second in the nation, mm -hmm. mathematics test. Wow, that's wonderful. And the younger one, who is, uh, well, he's 15 now, and the other one, the younger one, is 13, and he's also a very smart boy. He has an A, uh, A marks. He's doing great. Well, don't forget, both parents are teachers. Well, the mother is a teacher, and the father is a principal. So he was a teacher at one time. Mm -hmm. So uh, they know what to do with the children and bring them around to study, read, etc. And I, I'm just proud of them. So, so proud. Uh, how many people can really say that? You know, but you love your children no matter what. You love your grandchildren no matter what. And my feeling is I'm just proud because of what they're accomplishing. And I'm trying to help them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm so proud of them that I took Part of my IRA money, and I set it up 10, 10 years ago. I gave each of them $8,000. It's now up to $33,000 for college. So I'm so proud of it because of that. Money. This is what I did. And uh, I don't know what else to say. Then. Okay. I had a full life. I'm happy to be around at this time to see all this happening. As a matter of fact, we still have reunions for the USS Quincy. Mm -hmm. The crew members meet every year in a different city, a different place, uh, all over the nation. And uh, we have one coming up in, in Quincy, Mass. 
this year, which is named after him. The ship is named after him. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the second or third time we're having it there because we're opening up a museum for the Quincy there. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the town of Quincy, where we originally had the museum in City Hall, was moved to Battleship Row, where the Battleship Massachusetts is. And uh, it will be completed probably within a year of installing everything on the battleship, because we're finding out by uh, leaving in City Hall with no one to watch over, things were missing. Uh -huh. So we decided to, since the battleship row people are orphaned in space, because that's a government uh, sponsored program in battleship row, they have the, uh, government, uh, not troops, but uh, police there, the government police there. So they watch over everything. And uh, what else can I say? I've traveled, that's one thing I can say, I've traveled most, almost every place that I wanted to travel. Not only with the Navy, but more so in this station. If you want to see things, first see your own country. Mm -hmm. It's the best country in the world. Especially when you when you see things happening overseas, and you come back to this country, the freedom you have here compared to other countries. Okay, well that uh, sounds like a good point to end the interview. Thank you okay. very much. I thank you. Now maybe I'll drink some of this. <laughs>